Hello, my name is Sarah McClure, and today I'll be discussing InvisiNets, a new networking interface for cloud tenants. This is joint work with my advisor, Sylvia Ratnasamy, and our collaborators at Google and Microsoft. So enterprise cloud tenants often build infrastructure as a service deployments to run their long-lived services. These applications run on compute instances that reside within virtual networks or VPCs. Enterprise network operators will create a virtual topology connecting these endpoints using the available abstractions. And this can be a complex process in itself, as we'll see, but it's made worse by deployments that span multiple clouds and on-prem networks, as these deployments are both large and varied in the building blocks used to create them. So let's take a more specific look at what a tenant might have to consider in a deployment like this. We'll generally avoid using the terminology or abstractions of any one particular cloud, and I'll focus only on the networking abstractions, no compute or other services that may reside within the network. So first, the tenant will create a virtual network, where configurations such as the address space must be uh, specified. Notably, this address space is private, so getting connectivity out of this virtual network will require extra steps later. Within this will be potentially many subnets, all with their own configuration, as well as associated abstractions like security groups, which specify ACLs for the subnets. Then the tenant may need to connect their virtual network to other virtual networks or up to the internet or on-prem, and this can be done in many different ways, all with their own configuration and implications. In fact, this seemingly basic task of connecting virtual networks has inspired countless blog articles and tutorials. Even consulting with the first party documentation for AWS on how to connect your VPC to other networks will produce this list of options. And the virtual gateway or link that you use to build this connection could be any one of these available abstractions. The choice will depend on things like security requirements, uh, your remote target, whether the address spaces are overlapping, and more. Ultimately, all of these abstractions are different ways to get out of your private address space and connect to others on the internet. Even provisioning public IPs for whatever needs internet access won't be enough in AWS, as you need an internet gateway to get these external connections actually working. So after figuring out which gateway or link satisfies the requirement for the virtual network to virtual network connection, the tenant may place a firewall or another virtual appliance between the two virtual networks and create the route tables and routes necessary for each subnet to direct the traffic through the middle box and over the connection. Additional network appliances may need to be placed throughout the deployment, like load balancers, which again have many per cloud options to choose from and their own unique configuration and requirements like maybe needing their own subnet. Similarly, the tenant will choose and provision the necessary resource for the internet connection. And for the on-prem connection on the left, uh, one of the available connection options for links to other clouds and on-prem networks is dedicated links. These offer customers extra guarantees for reliability and performance, but uh, they require coordination with the cloud provider, the enterprise's ISP, a co-location facility, as well be as BGP and MPLS configurations. So all of this was to create a relatively small, simple deployment, um, but in short, this is a mess. So what's the root cause of this mess? In a tenant network, the tenant builds applications on top of the virtual network that they provision. This is running atop the cloud provider's network, which is ultimately running on a physical network. And despite this layered architecture, which normally gives rise to higher level abstractions, the abstractions exposed to tenants to build their networks often have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the devices you would use in a physical data center. Further, these building blocks are often necessary to use since the base abstraction, the virtual network, is a unit of isolation uh, which require, or prevents connectivity outside of its boundaries. And this approach made sense in the early cloud era when customers wanted a lift and shift experience when migrating to the cloud. But these abstractions are not fundamentally necessary, especially for cloud native enterprises. Further, this problem gets worse as we consider a multi-cloud deployment since each cloud has its own unique versions of these low-level building blocks. So an enterprise must actually manage several of these stacks in parallel. In light of this uh, complexity, we sought to create a new cloud tenant networking API which simplifies the tenant experience. Specifically, we want to make connectivity trivial to achieve and design instead around a tenant's high-level goals for their network, not low-level building blocks. These goals should be specified on endpoints so that tenants don't have to consider the network itself 
only what connectivity you choose for them between the resources they run. Well, it's the cloud provider's job to make it actually happen. So let's talk about how to achieve number one first. To make connectivity trivial, we don't want endpoints stuck in private address spaces and virtual networks that we have to construct our way out of. Instead, we want endpoints to be routable from anywhere, but we don't want them to just be open to anything on the internet. Therefore, our desired semantics are what we call publicly routable but default off, or PRDO. Here, all endpoints are routable by default, but traffic is denied unless explicitly permitted by the tenant. It's then the responsibility of the cloud provider to ensure that packets which are allowed in the permit list can reach the endpoint, but all other traffic is dropped. To achieve these semantics, we leverage existing cloud infrastructure with some slight modification. So let's take a look at roughly how cloud addressing works today before I modify it slightly. So each VM will have a direct IP that's routable within the data center network, a private virtual IP that's the private address that the tenant sees, and optionally, a tenant level public virtual IP. For external traffic coming from somewhere else on the internet, here P3, the packet routes to the software load balancer, which maps from the public virtual IP in the packet destination to the VM's direct IP and encapsulates accordingly. The packet's then routed to the, NIC, or to the VM where the NIC or vSwitch will strip the outer layer and deliver the packet to the VM. For a packet traveling between two VMs in the same private virtual address space, the SLB isn't needed. And at the host, the cloud provider can encapsulate the packet to the correct direct IPs and deliver the packet accordingly. These private address space connections were one of the sources of our problems earlier. Tenants have to use low-level building blocks if they want to connect outside this private address space. So what if we just got rid of private virtual IPs? This would give us trivial connectivity, but one could be rightfully concerned about the idea of giving all endpoints public IPs. Luckily, we can leverage what we just saw to make this less scary. With all public virtual IPs, assuming that we have the IPv6 uh, address space to achieve this, and that the two endpoints are routable to one another with their direct IPs, we can simply use the public IPs in place of the former private ones, where translation at the host is from public IPs to direct IPs. Note that we don't even need to install the binding for VM1 if it only has internal connections like this. As long as the direct IP the packet is heading to is reachable within the cloud network, the SLB isn't needed. So along with getting, pri or getting rid of private virtual IPs, we won't install bindings in the SLB when there are no external connections, and therefore the VM isn't actually reachable from outside the cloud network. Any traffic from outside won't reach the host unless the host has permitted some external IP, then the rule will be installed and the connection will work as it did before since this didn't involve any per uh, private virtual IPs before. So now we have a course level of protection where bindings in the SLB are only installed when external connections are actually allowed by the endpoint. But as the main line of defense, we'll use existing techniques to implement the permit list at the host. This allows us to expose PRD PRDO semantics without making endpoints actually reachable to external hosts and less explicitly permitted. So now that we have our connectivity assumption, we'll address the latter three goals by defining the API. As I mentioned, we'll define the API in terms of the tenant's high-level goals. I'll spend more time on the essential parts of the API in this talk, uh, the parts for connectivity, and I won't cover in detail how the API is supported. So we believe that the tenant's high-level goals are connectivity, availability, security, some sense of performance, and easy management. Accordingly, we give all endpoints a public endpoint IP, or EIP, and this alone gives routability, so there's no need for links or gateways anymore. Accordingly, or sorry, keep in mind that per endpoint permit list will protect these uh, endpoints. And for availability, we offer service IPs or SIPs, which can be bound to the EIPs and indicate to the cloud provider that the EIPs bound to the SIP should be load balanced together. For security, we offer cert, uh, uh, the PRDO semantics with per endpoint permit lists, and we allow tenants to use their security-minded middle boxes by configuring them out of band and annotating them on an endpoint. While I'll only briefly mention it in this talk, for performance, we want to approximate the effects of the dedicated links that I mentioned earlier uh, without requiring the low-level traffic engineering that they come with today. And we do this by allowing the tenant to reserve per region egress bandwidth and set uh, priorities for the traffic to fill that bandwidth. 
And then lastly, we offer grouping and naming mechanisms to make management easier. See the paper for more details on this API and how it's supported by the cloud provider. So now that we have the API, let's see how our original example changes. We'll now consider the endpoints in the deployment as these are important to Invisinets. So with Invisinets, we can disregard all the abstractions that are designed to create basic connectivity and instead see the endpoints and the permit list and middle boxes associated with them. Specifying the connectivity for an endpoint can be as easy as the code snippet shown here. And we can choose to see the permit list as defining the connectivity between the endpoints and effectively the topology itself. We've implemented the Invisinets API as a shim layer over existing Cloud Python SDKs. Many of the abstractions Invisinets exposes can be compiled rather simply to today's abstractions. However, since the Quas API requires infrastructure modification, we've only implemented a prototype of the new infrastructure that's necessary to realize it. While this is what we have now, the long-term vision for the implementation would be first-party implementations of, for each cloud provider. We're currently working on seeing this fully realized with our collaborators at cloud providers. Notably, in creating a common API, we're not explicit, explicitly expecting standardization across clouds, and we expect features and parameters to vary. But we believe that with a streamlined API, migration across clouds would be easier. We'll now take a quick look at evaluation. In the paper, we evaluate both the scalability of the proposed infrastructure changes, as well as the achieved simplicity for tenants. In this talk, we'll just focus on simplicity. And there's no agreed upon metric for it. So we offer a few lenses into what we achieve for the tenant. First, we take a look at example deployments and count the lines of code to create the deployment, as well as the number of network elements and points of configuration in the virtual topology. Note that in these counts, we'll ignore things that can exist in both APIs, like setting up endpoints and their IPs, as well as state that can be scaled arbitrarily, like ACL rules. Second, we take a broader view by scraping Terraform files from GitHub and determine how much we're eliminating from the tenant view. Check out the paper for further rationale of our metrics, as well as additional evaluation. So here we have our first case study, a generalized version of a design diagram from a multi-cloud startup, Aviatrix. We have two regions, each with a few virtual networks, protected by firewalls and connected to each other and on-prem with gateways, complete with direct links. While not shown, each of these virtual networks will have subnets, route tables, security groups, and more associated with them. And as I mentioned, we won't count instances themselves as boxes, as these can be scaled arbitrarily. And in both today's API and in Visinets, they carry per endpoint permit lists. So here's a look at what the deployment looks like with Invisinets. Let's compare our simplicity metrics for Invisinets, the first party API uh, available today, and the multi-cloud solution that designed this deployment. We can see that Invis Invisinets requires the tenant to consider far fewer network elements. In this case, nearly all the network state for the Invisinets deployment resides at the endpoints as permitless, while other in other approaches, the connectivity is embedded in an assortment of other abstractions. A script to create the deployment with first-party APIs, again, ignoring the code to set up the endpoints, will take well over 45 lines of code, much of which is dedicated to setting up routes for gateway connections and peerings between virtual networks, while the Invisinet script only has to set up the firewalls and egress bandwidth reservations. Let's take a look at another deployment. This one, again, is small, but has many different networking abstractions. We have two regions in Azure, with three virtual networks peered to one another inside, there's a load balancer, various gateways, a firewall, first-party cloud services, and direct links. And here's the same deployment with Invisinets. Again, we can compare the simplicity metrics across the approaches. And Invisinets only maintains the middle boxes that the tenant wants for security and requires configuration for the service IP and the egress bandwidth reservations. The lines of code for Invisinets are just the setup for these elements, while the first party script must set up gateways, peerings, and other abstractions. So overall, we see that Invisinets is significantly simpler as compared to the first party APIs of today. To get a broader sense of how much unnecessary configuration we're removing from today's deployments, we scraped GitHub repos for Terraform files mentioning VPCs and counted the number of times each networking abstraction is created and how many lines of configuration it adds. 
In doing so, we found that many of the abstractions designed to create private virtual address spaces and find a way out of them uh, are the most commonly occurring resources and contribute to most of the lines of code. In fact, in the files we scraped, in most of them, the majority of the lines in the file would be removed with InvisiNets. While using the InvisiNets API could very well add some lines of configuration that's not present today, for example, with maybe more permit list rules, this gives us an idea of exactly how much we're removing that the tenant has to consider. In conclusion, InvisiNets is a declarative API for tenant networking defined on endpoints that makes connectivity trivial and can decrease complexity up to 90%. Our code is available on GitHub, and I'm happy to take any questions.